Hello friends, and thank you for joining me again this week as we look at the elements of Lent. Our element this week that we're going to look into, that we're going to trace through the biblical story, is that of bone. How can we trace bone as an element throughout the Bible and specifically throughout the story of Jesus on his way to the cross and eventually to the empty tomb? Well, let's look at the beginning. Bone seems to be the essential core element of humanity. In fact, when we look at the very first two stories in the Bible, in Genesis, we get the second creation story where God, we talked about last week, takes uh, the mud and sculpts it into the human being and breathes his own life, his own spirit into the man. But what's interesting is the way the human's bone is described. So if we look at Genesis 2, 18 through 23, it says that the Lord God says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord formed every animal of the field and bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave, gave names to all cattle and birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man, this one was taken. What we see in this is this idea that the bone, the element of bone is sort of the seed of being human. It's not from the man's flesh that the woman is made. It's from his bones. Now, what's interesting when we look back at the ancient world, this focus on bone as the core human element is even obvious in archeology. span For instance, the, the whole process of interning a, interring a dead body would be that you would put them in a sarcophagus, which in Greek means flesh eater. So it would be sort of like a coffin, but with um, air able to get inside. And what this would do is help the flesh to quickly decompose and fall off of the bones. The bones were the lasting part of the human. And they would put these, after the flesh was done coming off of the, the corpse, they would put these bones in an ossuary, a bone box. That was the thing that would finally get buried, finally be interred. Because once the human's body had fully decomposed, the only thing left was bone. And so it's this emphasis on bone that we see even in the biblical text. And so in many passages, particularly in the Old Testament, the one's bones or the element of bone is meant to signal the very core of a human being. The prophets, the psalmists, all work with this notion of the bone being the core part of the human being. The prophet Jeremiah uh, says, my heart is crushed within me and all my bones shake. Chapter 23, verse nine. This notion that the very seat, the very, the very most granular place of the human where all of the feelings are, are, are felt and experienced is in the bones. Lamentations 1, 12 through 13 says, Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire, and it went deep into my bones. This feeling, this, this place of experience is bone as far as elements are concerned in the human body. And so when we're looking at uh, human skeletal bones, what we're looking at is the very seed, the very essential core, the DNA, 
which they didn't have language for back then, but even then it seems that they somehow knew that the foundations, the building blocks of being a human are contained in one's bones. Now here's what's interesting is another one of the prophets, Ezekiel, will use bones in this exact way, this notion of it being the seed of the human being. In Ezekiel chapter 23, oh, excuse me, 37, this is what we read. The hand of the Lord came upon me and set me down in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. He led me all around them, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, how can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so what happens? Well, Ezekiel does exactly what God says. He prophesied just as he was commandment, commanded. And then he says, suddenly, in verse 7, there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied, Ezekiel says, as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. So what we're seeing here is, although we've seen God make human beings out of mud and breathe life into them, and although we have seen God make all kinds of things out of nothing and all sorts and manners of material. Here in this particular passage, the bones of the humans are the seeds. They are the core element, the thing that God works with and that God builds them up from this core element, from this bone. And even though the bones are dry, dried out, they have no life in them, they are yet the place where God's creative power is being experienced. In fact, this takes us to yet another um, feature that we see of bone throughout the Bible, and that the one's bones are very specifically the place where truth is experienced. This is literally a motif that shows up over and over wherever we see bones. There's this notion that the bones know what is true and that they experience the truth. The psalmist says in the 35th Psalm, all my bones say, O Lord, who is like you? You deliver the weak from those too strong for them, the weak and the needy from those who despoil them. And what the psalmist is saying here is that the testimony of the truth, the way the Lord really is and really works, is held and is demonstrated by one's bones. And then again, Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 9 says, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, meaning God, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot. Jeremiah has been handed this divine truth, this divine message, what God knows and what God wants to be made known. And Jeremiah says, the place I experience the feeling of this truth, the place in my body where I can point to it and say, this is where it lives in me, is in the bones, in that very core, essential place of being human. I want us to go back to that passage in Ezekiel the valley of the bones, right? And I want us to listen to just those first six verses again. And I want you to hear the connection between these bones and this notion of experiencing truth. The hand of the Lord came upon me 
and he set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and they were very dry. And he said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Here we know that these dry bones are able to hear the word of the Lord. These dry bones will know that God is the Lord. And it's beautiful that it's these very bones that are absorbing and experiencing this truth that God is the Lord and that the word of God can speak life even into death. Now, we also think about the way that biblical writers express the experience of all the emotions in their bones, the feeling of pain, the feeling of truth, the experience of all these things. And we can also see how this can really have a lot of things in tension. So notice in the 51st Psalm, we have this from the psalmist saying to God, you desire truth in the inward being. You want me to experience truth in my bones. You want truth to be the DNA. You want truth to be the thing that is inside me. So therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And then notice this turn the psalmist makes. Let me hear joy and gladness and let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Do you notice how the psalmist starts with, you desire truth in the inside of my being. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Meaning in some sense, uh, it can be that our inward being loses its way. That our bones stop reverberating like a tuning fork with God's truth. And so the psalmist here says, those bones have actually been crushed. And yet God is going to bring restoration so that those bones will be whole and that they will resonate with the truth because that's what God desires in our bones, in our inward most being. This, the biblical writers also see bones as we talked about the, the ossuary, that bones were actually very holy. Um, by touching bones, one could be made ceremoniously unclean because they are so holy. And so that's the part of the human that is saved, that is buried, that is protected. And so one's bones are actually under God's protection, the place where God's um, deliverance is also seen. Isaiah chapter 58, in looking to the future when God is present and all of Israel is back in the land and living the life that God has designed for it, the prophet says, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. That there is some kind of connection to being able to live in the truth that God has for us and God making our bones strong. And then this passage in Psalm 34 Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from all of them. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. This notion that the righteous are so precious to God that their bones are not allowed to be destroyed or scattered or broken. Now, that may seem familiar because that brings us to one of our New Testament passages. The Gospel of John uh, crafts the narrative of Jesus's crucifixion with a specific attention that we don't get in any of the synoptic gospels on to Jesus's bones. John chapter 19 verses 31 through 36 tell the story this way. Since it was the day of preparation 
the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. Remember, it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, none of his bones shall be broken. So what we're seeing here is this recalling of this psalm, that even though the righteous are afflicted, God cares for their bones. That inward, most essential core place of them is still protected by God and is still holy to God. Now, here's where this passage, I think, gets even closer to all the other passages that we've looked at. Again, only in John's gospel, before Jesus is crucified, he has this conversation with Pontius Pilate. In John chapter 18, verses 37 through 38, Pilate asked Jesus, So, you're a king? And Jesus answered, Well, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked Jesus, What is truth? Isn't that interesting? The one who said, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And then a chapter later, Jesus's bones are preserved, are not permitted to be broken. This notion of truth being experienced deep down in the bones is somehow, interestingly enough, even here present in this telling of the crucifixion story. When Pilate asked, what is truth? He was looking at him, the one who is the truth and whose bones continually resonated with truth, that was able to see God's will and God's working in the world and be able to live in it authentically and truthfully. That's what this story gives us. What this also does for us is this shows us another aspect of what it means to understand Jesus's humanity. Think about the Gospel of Luke when Jesus has been raised from the dead by God and then he shows up where his disciples are in chapter 24 verse 36. And he stood among them and said, peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Part of understanding this whole divine event about Jesus dying and being raised from the dead was being able to acknowledge Jesus's human body, the fact that he is flesh and he is bones, that they could touch him. They could see where his flesh was pierced and they understood that his bones were all there intact. This really gets at what John the gospel writer says in the prologue to his gospel, that the word became flesh and lived among us. Yes, Jesus is divine, it seems. However, the funny thing is, the fact that he is flesh and bone tells us that he is also a fully human being. And notice this, the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory full of grace and truth. That truth was resonating in Jesus's bones, gave him the very fabric of who he is. But the good news is it shows us the fabric of who we are and we're meant to be. As human beings made by God, 
with these wonderful bones that our skeleton is made of, we also experience truth in our bones. Part of being human is being able to not only understand things with our minds, but to feel it in our human bodies. The truth isn't just something we assent to cognitively, but truth is something that permeates our beings. Truth is something that we can absolutely feel. And it took Jesus to show us this. He isn't erasing our humanity or telling us why we need to stop being human and be like God, but rather the word becoming flesh and living full of grace and truth showed us how we already have the good bone structure of being everything that God wants us to be. In fact, that's why John continues in verse 16 of chapter one, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son who has made him known. When we look at God in human flesh and see him full of grace and truth, flesh and bones, we also see a mirror of the creation that he made that is flesh and bones and that we also have this opportunity to live full of grace and truth, feeling that truth resonating deep down inside of us, where it permeates us, where it's part of everything we do. Deep down in our bones, we feel, we acknowledge, and we operate out of this truth that we watched Jesus live before us. Praise God for that. Thank you for being with me this week. And I'll see you next week in our last week when we discuss the element of palms. <laughs>